Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. Uh, let's get go ahead and get started with uh, assignments of chapter nine. So tonight we will go over the assignments of chapter nine, and uh, at the end we will discuss the case study, which is the Bank US, uh, uh, USA case. Um, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen with you. Okay, so uh... first part of your assignment is an optional exploring operations activities. Uh, on the moving average, exponential smoothing, and uh, regression analysis, and comparing basically the uh, different methods in terms of MSE, and also uh, comparing moving average and exponential smoothing uh, forecasts. So let's go ahead and uh, work on these. These are basically the assignments of those interactive graphs that we saw in class when we worked on them uh, in class together. Uh, give me one second. Let's see. Fantastic. Okay, so let's start with the first assignment, uh, Exploring Operations Moving Average Forecast. Okay, so here we have a, uh, it's pretty close to what we saw, as I, said, as I mentioned, in, in class. Uh, this is the same, basically, uh, graph and uh, it basically goes over night forecast which is a one month moving average and then two mo months moving average three months moving average and four months moving average and calculates mse for you and shows that as you move along and increase the number uh, for the period set to consider for calculating the moving average the level of smoothness of your uh, predictions would be would get increased so uh, based on this graph, we have to answer a few questions. First question says, for the milk sales data shown, which of the following forecasting techniques result in the smallest mean squared error? So basically what you need to do is just click on these different methods. You see that for naive forecast, you have 2,462. Here you have 1614. 1475 and 1538. You see that the sweet spot here is three months moving average, which has the high, lowest uh, mean squared error. Uh, question number two, the milk sale volume decreased significantly in month 11. For which forecasting method does the estimate for month 12 change the most when compared to the estimate for month 11? Meaning, which is the most responsive to changes in the data? Okay, so uh, even without looking at this uh, graph, you should be able to tell me which one is the most responsive, okay? Uh, again, as you remember uh, from our discussion, as you go from naive forecast towards your two-month moving average, three-month moving average, and four-month moving average, the level of smoothness of your graph increases. That means that is, uh, the level of responsiveness decreases. So uh, that means that the most responsive uh, is the naive forecast. And as you can see here, this is also shows that okay, this is uh, exactly uh, shows how uh, from uh, actual value of the uh, mo uh, month 12, if it is weeks or 12 months. Uh, yeah, month 11 to month 12, you see that this is the highest uh, fluctuation and most responsive. And okay, so this is going to be the naive forecast. And then the milk, sale, milk sales volume decreases significantly in month 5. For which forecasting method does the estimate for month six actually increases slightly, okay? So as you can see here in month five, uh, that you have here, um, the uh, sales basically decreases, okay? But we want to see which one of these have basically increase, uh, which one of the forecasts basically increase in month uh, six, okay? So you see that for naive forecast, we see a decrease for... Uh, two month moving average, you see a decrease. Uh, for a three month moving average, you see a decrease. And for four month moving average, you actually see an increase between months five and six. So, which is the opposite of 
the actual direction of these two ones. So that would be the answer here for uh, question number three. And then for question number four, which for which method is the first forecast value available uh, the soonest? So this is again pretty straightforward, and we have only one month, uh, one period uh, moving average, which is the naive forecast. Our data is available as soon as we have the data for the first month, and we can start forecasting for uh, the second month. So this is uh, our. First part of the assignment, let's go to second part, which is the exponential smoothing forecast. So here, again, we have the exponential smoothing graph, and we, these are the values of alpha, which we can change. We can start from zero all the way to one. Again, you remember uh, for one, the value of uh, uh, value of alpha equals to one would be a naive forecast. Basically, it's going to be ft plus alpha times at minus ft. And then if uh, if uh, alpha is one, it's going to be ft plus at minus ft, which is basically ft plus one is exactly at, equal to at, meaning that the forecast for the next period is going to be the actual value of this period. Okay. So, and then uh, as you see, as, as we increase, uh, as we decrease the uh, level of alpha, means that we are putting uh, uh, basically, for example, 20% uh, emphasis on the, the error and 80% emphasis and 80% weight on the previous period, okay? So that basically smooths the, the process. So now uh, let's go ahead and based on this, take a quick look at the questions. For what values of the smoothing constant alpha does the exponential smoothing method looks like a naive forecast method? So we just saw that it's a value of one. And then question number two, for what values of a smoothing contest and this uh, co constant uh, results in the smallest mean squared error. So we can just check these four or five values that we have. We have value of zero. We see that it is 16, uh, 1636. We have value of 0.18, which gives us 1282. We have value of 36, which gives us 1390. I have value of 0.5, which gives us 1543. And finally, we have value of one, which gives us 2,462.55. Again, as you can see, 0.18 was the lowest value to 1,282.73 is the amount of MSC. So that is gonna be the answer here. And then part three, which of the following is least accurate? Uh, so let's take a look at these one by one. The smaller the value of a smoothing forecast, uh, smoothing constant, the smoother the forecast series. So that's correct. As we remember, when we decrease this value of alpha, uh, this uh, will be uh, smoother. Uh, our forecast would be much smoother. Uh, so this is correct, and it's not least. So this is correct, and it's not least accurate. So that's not the answer. Uh, B says when the smoothing constant is zero, the mean squared error error is minimized. So as you remember from uh, the previous question, the MSE doesn't have anything to do, it doesn't have a, a, a direct relationship with alpha, and uh, it basically goes up and it comes down. So that is the answer. This is not accurate. But now let's take a look at C and D and see why they are correct. Uh, the larger the smoothing constant, the less weight the forecast places on the prior forecast values. This is again correct. So uh, when we have a value of, for example, pretty close to one, we are putting a very great emphasis on the very uh, you know, and on the, on, the, on the current period, basically, and we are putting, for example, we are putting, if this is 90%, uh, we are putting 90% weight on the current period, and we are putting uh, 20%, 10% uh, weight on the forecast of the uh, current period, which is carrying the all the previous uh, months or periods with itself. So we are putting only 10% weight on the whatever is 
uh, not included in this period. Okay, so that is true as well. And the smoothing constant must always be between zero and one. That's also correct. So the answer here is B. Let's go ahead and look at question. Uh, look at uh, exploring operations, linear trend forecasting. Here we have an example of regression model. And here, the regression equation is being approximated for us with these data. If we include one year worth of data all the way to 15 years worth of data. So question number one says, uh, which of the following is least accurate? Okay. So the first one, when eight years of data are used, the forecast for year nine is higher than the actual value. So we can check that. This is eight years. And you see that the forecast for year nine is, this is year nine, is greater than the actual value, slightly higher than the actual value. So this is correct. It's not least accurate. Uh, when the forecast, when forecasting a year 12 energy sales, the regression equation is 15.2 plus 0.27 times year, okay? So when we are forecasting for year 12, it means that we are using 11 years worth of data. And you can see that this is the correct uh, regression equation, 15.2 plus 0.27. So this is also correct. So this is not the answer. Now, uh, option C, the model formula for energy cost using nine years of data is the same as the formula for using 10 years worth of data. So we can check that. So if we use nine years, it's going to be 15.2 plus 26 times X. If we use 10, it's going to be 15.2 again, 26 times X. So this is also correct. So by logic of elimination, D is our answer, but let's take a quick look at it. The R squared value for the energy cost formula using nine years of data is the same as R squared when using 10 years worth of data. Remember that nine years and 10 years, the uh, basically uh, equation is the same. But as you can see, if you look at the R squared, you see that R squared, R squared changes as we increase the uh, data points that we are including in our regression equation, our R squared is also increasing so that is not correct and that's the answer to this question question number two which of the following is not true when comparing the use of seven years of data relative to using six years of data i mean uh, meaning uh, adding a seventh data point to the regression model so we are comparing between six and seven so comparing between these two equations okay but let's take a quick look. Uh, first option says that the amount of variability explained in the model increases. Okay, so let's take a look. If we are here at 6, you have R squared of 0.91. When we go to 7, your R squared actually decreases. So this is not true, okay? And this basically could be the answer, or, or it is the answer. So let's take a quick look at the other three and see if they are actually correct. The forecast for year eight is higher than the actual value for year eight. So forecast for year eight means that we are using seven years worth of data. And you see that the forecast is higher. So this is correct. And then forecast for year eight is about the same as forecast for year seven. Okay. So this is forecast for year eight. And this is forecast for year seven. You see that they are uh, vertically speaking on the vertical axis. They are almost the same value so this is also correct and the forecast uh, the slope of the trend line decreases uh, so when you go from six to seven you see that the slope decreases this is a uh, higher slope and when you are using the six years data and then you go to seven years the slope decreases so that is also correct so that's why uh, option a is the correct answer Fantastic. Let's go to to next part of our assignment, which is uh, exploring operations, uh, moving average and exponential smoothing fit. So this is a little uh, typo here. This says uh, the title. Just the title is a um, basically 
fit mixed with the other uh, assignments. This is moving average exponential smoothing fit. However, this is a linear trend. So we are still working on regression and we are working on the same graph. Uh, so here says that compare the regression line using five data points to regression line using 11 data points. Which of the following statements is least accurate? Again, we are looking at the option that is not correct. So we are comparing five with 11. So this is the regression uh, equation that we get for 11. And this is the regression equation that we get for uh, five. Now let's go ahead and take a quick look. Okay, it says that... Uh, compare the regression line using five data points to the regression line using 11 data points, which of the following statements is least accurate. So first one, uh, the regression line uh, equation for the five-year model is 14.7 plus 0.43. So you can see that this is correct, 14.7 plus 0.43. So this is correct, and it's not the answer. Uh, the regression line for 11 year model is 15.2 plus 0.27. So we go to 11 here. I see that it's 15.2 plus 0.27. This is also correct. So that's not the answer as well. Uh, C, the amount of variation explained by the number of years for five years is less than for the 11 years model. So 11 years, you see that R squared is 0.93. And for five, it is 0.94. 95 almost. So this is not accurate. So we can say that this is the answer. Let's check D as well. The magnitude of the estimated trend for five data points is larger than that of 15 data points. Data points. So, uh, so you can see that this is for five data points and this is for 11 data points. So the uh, um, the uh, magnitude here is uh, the slope. Uh, the slope basically is 0.43, and uh, for 11, the slope is 0.27. So slope decreases, or the magnitude basically decreases. So that's correct. That the magnitude for five data points is much larger than 15 uh, data points. And uh, this, this should be a typo. This should be 11 again. Like all of these between five and 11. So which of the following is most accurate? Uh, the higher the R squared value, the better the model predicts the next uh, data point. So R squared basically says that what percentage of the variability in Y is explained by X, okay? So if the uh, R squared is, for example, 90%, means that 90% of the variation in Y has been explained by X. It doesn't have anything to do with the predictability of the model, okay? How do we know if model is uh, better in prediction? MSE is the, uh, basically a value for error that shows that the prediction is more accurate or less accurate. R squared uh, is the amount of uh, variation that is explained by this regression equation. Okay, so now uh, let's go to B, option B in general, especially as more data points are added, the, uh, there appears to be about the same number of data points above and below the regression line. This is correct. This is basically the whole idea of uh, least squares method. Again, as you, as you remember, we have a trend, uh, we fit this trend line in a way that the basically uh, squared value of the errors or the differences between the actual observations and forecasts are the minimum. So that's why this basically is somewhere uh, all the way in between of all these lines. So this is correct. So B is our answer, but let's take a look at C and D as well. Uh, C, as more data points added, the value of R squared consistently increases. This is not true. Sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases. R squared has a specific formula, which is a little beyond the scope of our work. We use software to do all these calculations. And part D for a variable like energy that is generally increasing with the value of the independent variable like year, as in this example, using more data always results in a larger slope of the regression line. That's also not correct. The slope doesn't have to do anything with the higher amount of uh, data points that we use or not. It's basically the uh, shape of the trend that determines the slope of a regression line. Now, question number three, which of the following is least accurate? So for year one and year two model, 
Uh, R squared is always one because all the variability in the dependent variable is captured by the model. That's correct. Again, as you can see here, if you use only one, basically years of year worth of data or two years worth of data, R squared is always one. Everything that uh, all the all the variation in Y is explained by the model. So uh, this is correct. So it's not the answer is not least accurate. So a part B, the model with the weakest R squared value is the three year model. So again, we can go ahead and check that. So this is the three year model, which is 0.82. And we can increase this and see if there's anything less than that. And we can see that this is also correct. Okay. So this 82 is the lowest. So that's also correct. So it means that this is not the answer. Uh, C, other than year one, uh, other than the one year and two year model, the model with the strongest R squared value is the 15 year model. Again, we can go ahead and take a look. We see that the values of R squared are changing. And as we increase the, the number of years, we see that at 15, we have a much higher uh, R squared compared to all other previous R squareds. Uh, so this is uh, also correct, which means that it's not the answer. Again, by the logic of elimination, we know that D is the answer. However, let's take a quick look. The estimate for year 10, you meaning using nine uh, data points, is the same as the estimate for year 11 using 10 data points. Again, this is correct. So we can take a look. Nine and 10, you see that both regression equations are the same. So this means that the estimates would be the same as well. Uh, so this is the answer here, and we are done with this part as well. Let's go and review the last uh, interactive, if I'm not mistaken. Did we review everything? Yes. So the last one, which is a comparison between the moving average and single exponential smoothing. Okay. So let's go ahead and review this real quick together. Again, we have these two graphs side by side on top of each other, basically. This is the moving average, and this is the single exponential smoothing. And you have these questions. It says that first, which of the moving average methods result in the smallest MSE? Okay, between naive two, three, or four. Again, we can take a quick look here. This MSE here is 11.91. Two months is 6.78, 5.98, and 6.21. So three is, again, the smallest. What value of alpha minimizes the MSE for the exponential smoothing? Okay, So for the exponential smoothing, again, we move this, and you see that pretty close to around five, you see that we have the higher, lowest value. So it, it goes down and down and down. And then after here, it just in, it starts increasing. Okay. So see that some, somewhere around 55, we can say that we have the smallest MSE. Okay. So this is C. And then for the data given, uh, what is the smallest value of alpha where the exponential smoothing forecast is more accurate, a smaller MSE than the two month moving average of uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or there's no such uh, alpha, okay? So uh, two month moving average, let's take a look at the two month moving average. This is the MSE here, 6.78. And let's take a look. None of our MSEs is as low as 6.78. As you saw, the lowest MSE that we have in the exponential smoothing is just upon 9.6, and this, this is much higher than MSE, so we can say that there is no such alpha. And then finally, for what value of alpha does the exponential smoothing method have the same MSE as the naive forecast? Again, uh, we know the answer to this one. Uh, naive forecast is the same as alpha 0.1. And we can say, see that uh, basically MSEs are exactly equal to each other because basically they are the same model. So that is also C. And that concludes our work here in these interactive graphs. Let's go ahead and start working on our assignment. So we have one uh, analytical assignment. 
and then we have two Excel activities and one uh, conceptual piece of work. Now let's first start with the analytical work that we need to do. Okay. So question number one is uh, asking us to calculate the MSE, MAD, and MAPE for this data that is available to us. Okay, let's go ahead and start a little Excel spreadsheet. And then we can go ahead and start building this together. So you can always copy these values and paste them here and then do a little uh, cleanup basically. So this is the customer satisfaction score. This is basically my A sub T for the actual values. And these are the forecasts, which is my F sub T values. And then here I can go ahead and let's make them a little more concise and visually more appealing. So this is the data that we have. The first thing that we need to calculate is basically in order to be able to calculate MSE, MAD, and MAPE is to calculate the error. Okay? Again, as you remember, MSE, this is the formula for MSE that we will use. Uh, the formula for MSE has uh, at, at basically at the core of it, it has AT minus FT squared. So for in order to calculate this, we need to calculate this AT minus FT. Okay. So error, which is a sub t minus f sub t is going to be equal to this value minus this value. And I will copy it down. And again, those that I'm using a formula for, I'm going to put the formula here so we can refer back to this. This is a formula that we used here for uh, calculating error. And then we need to uh, square these errors and then take an average of those, okay? So next thing that we need to calculate is the squared errors. So this is my squared error, which is this value, carrot two or to the power of two. And then I copy it down. Again, this is the formula that I used here. Okay. So now the rest is basically taking an average. We are adding all these up and dividing them by the total number of time periods. Or basically we are taking an average. So we can say that and put this down so we know what we are talking about. So here we are getting an average of all these values. So I say an average of these squared errors. And this is the formula that I used. And this is going to be my MSE, basically. Okay. Now, next thing that I need to calculate is MAD. And please stop me if you have any questions. Next thing that I need to calculate is MAD. Again, yeah, for MAD, you see that here I have uh, a T minus F T absolute value of A T minus F T. So what I need to calculate is absolute error basically. So I go ahead and calculate the absolute error. And this is how we're gonna show it. And that's going to be equal to ABS, or absolute value of this error that you have here. And then I copy it down. These are the formula that I used. And let's ignore this error. And finally, we need to get an average. So once we have all the values of 80 minus 50, we just need to get an average of that. And that's going to be my basically MAD. So we see that my MAD is now 2.3. And then finally, I need to calculate MAPE. And MAPE, again, if you remember from the lecture, 
MAPE is uh, given by this formula, which is basically the AT minus FT or the error divided by the actual value and uh, the, score, uh, the absolute value of that. Okay, so it's basically percentage of absolute error or absolute percentage error. Okay, so this is going to be absolute percentage. Error, which is 80 minus FT divided by 80. Okay, so this is my error divided by A sub T. Okay, now this is going to be basically absolute value as ABS, and I have 80 minus FT over here divided by actual value, which is here. Copy this down. Now I have everything here. Next thing is to calculate the average. So I can go ahead and get the average here. And these are all the formula that I used. Let's take care of these uh, error messages. And finally, one more thing that we need to do here is that this needs to be expressed as a percentage or multiplied by, should be multiplied by 100. So what we need to do is change the basic format here to a percentage and use the number of decimals that is required by the question. Two or three usually works. Okay. So this is uh, our first question, calculating uh, different me measures of error for this data set that this time series that is available to us. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Now let's go to question number two. Question number two here, we have Cynthia's design studios that had sales the last four months uh, of 13,700, 15,400, 17,150, and 18,850. Sales are related to how many designers Cynthia has on duty. The sales forecast helps her decide on the proper staffing levels around your answers to the nearest whole number. So here's asking what is the forecast for the fifth month using a two period moving average? And what is the forecast for the fifth month using an alpha point nine? So we are using this data in uh, moving average and as, as well as single exponential smoothing. So let's go ahead and use the templates that are available to us. So here, first we have the moving average. Let's go ahead and use this template. Okay. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and remove all the data that is available here, and then look at my question. Okay, so my question says that use a two period moving average. So basically means that my K is two, and my data points are 13,700, 15,400 and uh, 17,150 and 18,850. So I can go ahead and do a little copy and paste here and enter these values 13,700, 15,400, 17,150 and 18,850. And that's it. Basically, I'm done. This is the forecast for month five, which is 18,000. And this is my MSE using the moving average technique. Okay. Now, uh, it's asking me to do a, a forecast for the fifth month using an alpha of 0.9. Okay. So now let's go ahead and use that. So we're going to go ahead and use the exponential smoothing uh, template. Let's go ahead and get the exponential smoothing template. So again, let's go ahead and enter this data that we have for periods worth of data. And uh, 
So this is my data points. And I know that my alpha should be 0.9, okay? So uh, I'm good. I can go ahead and say that, okay, this is the basically uh, forecast for month number five. Let's go ahead and check this and see if this is correct, okay? Let's go ahead and check it here and no, it's not correct. What's wrong? It might be a good idea here to pause the video and review what we did. So to see if you can find out what went wrong, why I got the wrong answer here. Take a look at the question real quick again. So you see that A4 is 18,850, okay? So this is A4, this is correct, okay? Our F4, here I have 16,900, 16,983, okay? This is different from this forecast. So I need to overwrite this manually, okay? 16,983, okay? That's basically what I overread manually. Now you see that my uh, forecast for month five is gonna be different. Let's check that and see if this is correct. Yes, this is correct. Okay, so a little hint, sometimes when you have a specific value for, for a forecast, means that it's an adjusted value, you need to incorporate those. And again, a little technicality, if you are using uh, the templates that come with uh, the book uh, are available on MindTab, you cannot do any of these. You cannot change the numbers uh, besides the yellow sets. Okay, so it's always a good idea to use the templates that I have uploaded on Moodle. Those are the instructor versions and you can use and do whatever you want with them basically. Question number three. So here we have exotic wines incorporation wants to use exponential smoothing with alpha of 0.5 to forecast demands in bottles sold. The demand uh, for the last four months, uh, there's a four missing here, are such and such. The forecast uh, for bottles was 2,321 bottles for second month. Uh, what is the forecast for the fifth month? Round your answer to the nearest whole number. Again, here we are doing any single, single exponential smoothing. Uh, my monitor, the stop, monitor stopped working. Uh, I have a, I, give me one second. Uh, have a faulty cable, I guess. Let's see. I think I'm back. Fantastic. So this is again an exponential smoothing question. So we have these values from uh, 2021 all the way to 4412. And uh, we need to use the uh, single exponential smoothing template to solve this problem. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use this again here and a special. So let's change this back to when the formula was there, and then pay special only the values. And here we just need to double check that this 2321 is correct. This is the value that has been instructed for uh, demand for the last month. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the forecast for bottles uh, for second month was 2321. We need to double check that. It's always the same this, but uh, for mind five, we want the forecast, which is 5669. I'm sorry, we need to change this to 0. 0.5. And this is going to be the forecast 10,697. And we have, let me see if I made any mistakes anywhere. Yes, this is not correct. So this was the overridden value that we put there. So now everything is correct. So I have a 0.5 here. And uh, for the fifth month, my forecast is gonna be 37.32. Go ahead and enter that and check if everything is, is correct. Now let's go ahead and review question number four. 
Uh, a linear regression model is units equal to 3,309 minus 0.779 times week for week 47. What is the forecast of the number of units? This is a very straightforward question. Again, uh, you have a uh, equation and you're plugging a number in it just for the sake of being through. I'm going to go ahead and solve it. So here we have a, uh, these are my values, 3,309 and 0.779, negative 0.779. Okay. So I know that my uh, intercept is 3,309 and my slope is negative 0.779. And my the number of weeks that I'm interested in forecasting for is 47. I want to find out what is the forecast. So it's going to be basically the intercept plus the value of the slope times uh, the value of x, which we are looking for. And that's going to be basically my uh, forecast for month 47 or period 47. And this is the formula that I exist. Okay, very straightforward question. Now, question number five. Uh, here we have uh, Canton Supplies, uh, which is a service firm that employs approximately 100 people. Because of the necessity of meeting monthly cash obligations, the chief financial officer wants to develop a forecast of monthly cash requirements. Because of a recent change in uh, equipment and operating policy, only the past seven months of data are considered relevant. Uh, the change in uh, operations has had a great impact on cash flow. What forecasting model do you recommend? Okay, so basically you see that here, it's up to us to find out what uh, forecasting model we should use. Use the moving average and exponential smoothing uh, templates or other Excel tools to help you answer this question, okay? So, First, uh, we have the um, we have been asked for MSEs of uh, different moving averages and to find out which one is the best, and then MSEs for different alphas and also for a regression model with the MSE. We need to find out we compare these three models and find out which one is the best model. Okay, so let's go ahead and start working on this. First, we need to do a uh, basically a uh, moving average. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and use the moving average template. So this is the moving average and uh, my values, let's go ahead and copy and paste this. And paste the example here. Okay, so these are my data. So from 192 to 196, Go ahead and paste only the values here and then get rid of all this. Don't need them. And let's uh, review it one by one. So if we have a K of two, this is our forecast and this is our MSE. So let's take note of these somewhere. So for example, here, I would say that this is, this is my values of K. Uh, what is going to be the value of uh, MSE? Let's take a build a little table for ourselves. So we do a values of K two, three, and four, and we want to compare these uh, in terms of the value of MSE. So for two, our MSE is seven hundred fifty nine point oh five. Let's take a note of that, and then if we change this to three. See that our MSE changes to 1257.83. Paste this here. And also if we change this to four, this will be 591.19. So this is the final value, okay. Uh, again, number of decimals and so on. And you can see that here between these three, four is the best model. Okay, and again, let's go ahead and check one of these and see if they are answering everything correctly. So this is correct. And you see that the four month moving average is the best model. Now we need to uh, run it around the same data in the single exponential smoothing and with all these different values of alpha. 
from point one to point nine. Okay, let's see how we can do this. Again, data that they have is from 192 to 196. So your values might be different, are different from this. So let's paste all this. And let's just start with value of alpha point one. Okay. So let's build a little table again here for values. There are different values of alpha and different values of uh, MSD. Okay, so this is alpha and this is MSD. Okay, so what I can do is I can go ahead and do uh, one by one. For example, uh, for point one, I see that it is 1295 or uh, again, I can go ahead and plug in point two and read the value and so on and so forth. And uh, it's gonna be very time consuming. And uh, even if, uh, so here I have only 10 numbers and it's doable like in a, a few minutes, but if I, if, you, if I have like 100 numbers that I want to plug in one by one and get the answers, it's not gonna be very uh, uh, efficient. So what I can do is to use a Excel function called uh, data table. Okay, so what I will do first, I will build my uh, point one to point nine. Okay, and just for the sake of increasing the number to make it a little more interesting, let's see that we are doing this at the intervals of point five. Okay, point zero five. So we have all these different values of alpha. Suppose that the question is asking us to calculate the MSD for all these values of alpha. It's gonna be very time consuming if you want to plug in one by one here and calculate. But Excel can uh, do this for us, okay? So what we need to do is to say that, for example, for point one, this is the answer, okay? So I will say equal to this value, okay? So what I'm doing is that, let me make this a little, so this is the one that I could use. Okay, so basically here, I am saying that this value corresponds to the value that I want to get from uh, E30, okay? Then I, what I do, I will select everything here, okay? Select these two cells, okay? And then I would say that uh, I would go to data and I click on what if analysis, and I click on data table. Okay, so so far we have used goal seek. Now we are using data table. Click on data table and say that, okay, I want you, right, I'm telling Excel that I want you to go ahead and take this column, okay, the values that you see in this column, take these and enter them one by one here, okay? So forget about row input, we don't have rows. You have just one column. So I, I'm telling Excel to get these values from 0.15 all the way to one enter them here, and then read the value that you get in E30, okay? I okay the way, and I get all the values of MSE with just one click, okay? And then I can highlight the one that is lowest, so I can go ahead and click on conditional formatting, and here I can find the uh, smallest value, so I can say they can show me the bottom first value, and you see that this is the lowest uh, amount. So 0. 0. 0.7 is giving me the lowest MSE. Still, this MSE is higher than the MSE that I got here in the moving average, okay? So, so far I have taken care of the uh, moving average with different values of K, 2, 3, and 4, and uh, different values of alpha, and found out that 0.7 is the lowest value, uh, alpha, alpha of 0.7 is the lowest uh, uh, MSE. It gives me the lowest MSE. Okay, so this is, again, let's check this and see if this is incorrect. And then need to find a regression model, okay? So uh, uh, again, we are using the same data and we are building a regression. So here, I'm gonna you do it two different ways okay, to uh, answer a few questions that I have received from you, okay? First, let's go ahead and do it this way, okay? So paste special and paste values, okay? So this, this is my data series. So I click on data, I click on data analysis, and then I click on regression, click okay. And first I input my Y range, 
which is here. And then I have my X range, which is here. I don't have labels in the first row. And I want my output to be, for example, here, okay? And that's that, okay? Okay, the wave, and I get this uh, regression output. Okay, so these are the values that we are interested in mainly. Okay, so our coefficients are uh, basically, so my, my regression equation is basically going to be R of Y equals to 216.71 plus 1.5. 57 times x. Okay, so this is my regression equation. I can go ahead and check this and see if this is correct. So, for example, this is my uh, intercept, and this is my uh, slope. And uh, MSE. So, MSE, remember from the lecture that uh, you can find the value of MSE right here. So this is MS, and this is due to error or residual. So this is the value of MSE. Let's go ahead and enter that here and check this work and see if everything is correct. Okay, so value of MSE is not correct. It's due to the small places. Again, it's a good idea to pause here the video and see why the MSE that I got in my regression uh, output is not being accepted here in my tab. Pause the video for a few seconds and think about it. So let's try it in a different way. So here we have the Let's do it the basically traditional way. Okay, so these are my uh, time periods. Okay, and here are my uh, I have values of a sub t. Okay, and let's here we have value of f sub t. Okay, and f sub t is basically based on these two. I can go ahead and calculate them. So f sub t is going to be basically this intercept plus this value times the slope that I have here. And then I will uh, lock the slope and also lock the intercept because I want to copy it. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this down. And this is the formula that I used here. Okay. So I'm basically calculating Ft based on this regression equation that I just got. Okay. So formula. And then I go ahead and calculate the FT minus, uh, AT minus FT, okay? So this is gonna be my error, okay? T minus FT. And it's gonna be equal to this value minus this value. Okay, so this is not, this doesn't seem to be accurate at all. Hmm. Let's see what's happening. Okay, make a mistake. So it should be A1, A2, basically. Okay, so this is my X. This is not my X. No. That was a mistake. So I fix that. Now this is correct. Now this is my AT minus FT. Copy it all the way down. And then I need to get the AT minus FT squared. Okay, so AT minus FT squared. Okay is going to be equal to this value to the power of two okay and then copy everything down okay now if i get uh here's the interesting part basically there are two different uh, approaches which uh, which one is more uh, accurate okay so if i get the average of these this is basically going to be my uh, uh mse okay so let's go ahead and get this average of all these and you see that it is 513.26, which is quite different from the 718, okay? So let's let's do it in two steps. First, let's get the sum here. See that this is the 
some of these values, okay? And then get the average. Okay. I will explain why I'm doing it in two steps. So this is the sum and this is the average. You see that this average is quite different from this average, okay? So let's try this as well, see if this works. Yeah, this is sounds problematic. I don't know. Didn't happen in the past, but anyway. Uh, so the, this is the correct value of MSE. Okay, this is the correct value of MSE since it is not accepting it. Uh, let me go ahead one do it one more time. Let me see if this is giving me the same wrong answers. Uh, so data analysis regression. I checked this a few times and was not ever so. Okay, I have table this time. And suppose that I want the second summary here. And everything else is correct. So 718, exactly the same, okay. So uh, there, there must there must be an error again. Okay. Again, I checked it a few times and it didn't give me this error, but it's giving me this error. Does not now. This is the correct answer. Okay, so I will go ahead and manually overwrite the grade for everyone. Uh, now, tell me why these two numbers are different. Okay, because this was the question that I received a few from a few of you that were calculating the MSE the manual way, basically or semi-manual way using the formula or using this uh, Excel, basically, tool. Why these two are different? Again, please pause the video and see if you can find out what is the reason behind this discrepancy. Okay, now let's take a look at this number. I look at this number and this number. What do you see? They're the same, okay? This is the sum of the squares, okay? So sum of squared, so sum, and these are all squared errors. So SS that you see here is sum of squares, and residual is the same term for errors, okay? So this is the sum of the squares, okay? And you see that this, now here, I divided this by seven, okay? Because I have seven time periods, okay? So this average basically is this divided by seven, okay? Now let's see if I divide this by five, okay? So I have a five here, okay? So let's see if I divide this by five, what happens, okay? If I get this value and divide it by five, you see I get exactly 718, okay? What's happening is that MSE, when you are calculating MSE for regression equation, instead of getting, instead of getting the sum of the squares and dividing them by N, which is the number of time periods, you divide them by N minus two for a simple linear, linear regression, okay? n minus one, n minus, n minus one, minus one, okay? Minus one is the first one is basically the number of independent variables. Second one is for the degrees of freedom. Again, this is gonna be a little beyond the scope of our work. It's too much statistics. Long story short, whenever you're calculating the MSE or regression, don't use this formula. Or if you're using this formula, if you have one independent variable, uh, make the denominator uh, uh, n minus two, if you have two independent variables, make it n minus three or so on. Or if you want to be, be safe, just use go this uh, uh, tool and use read the MSE from here, okay? And this, this usually usually works. I mean, uh, this is the first time that I'm seeing this error uh, solve it for different classes and it's uh, working. But anyway, I will give the grade for everyone to, uh, for this. And uh, whenever you are doing the uh, MSE for um, aggression equation, long story short, uh, safest, your safest bet is to use this technique and just use this MSE, okay? Again, uh, so even if this is uh, correct, 718, uh, you see that the lowest MSE is this tail, this uh, basically, uh, this is 873, this is, 718, and in your moving average, you had 519. So your best model is a moving average with K of four, okay? That's the model that you should go ahead and use.
Now let's go ahead and continue our work. Uh, go to question number six. So here I have uh, forecast and actual sales of digital music players at July. Uh, uh, sales music, same same music are as follows. Um, uh, just say music, I'm sorry. Just say music are as follows from March to October. And we are using the moving average template to basically first find the graph and then find the, the forecast for November using a two period moving average and a three period moving average and compare the MSEs. Again, this is a rather straightforward question. Uh, let's go ahead and solve it anyway. So this is my moving average template. Let's go ahead and use these values. This is my forecast and this is my actual sales. So I need to just use the actual sales values. Paste them. here and then I need to first I need to do a graph okay so a graph to compare the basically uh, uh, forecast data and the actual data so for this I can go ahead and use this data set that I have and go ahead and click on insert and click a click on a uh, scatter diagram and use this one that connects them to each other and that's basically is going to be okay. it's going to be my uh, chart. I can go ahead and compare this chart that I have here with these different charts and see which one is the correct answer. Okay, so as I can see, this one is pretty close to uh, this last one. This 170, I missed that 170 here, that here as well. Yeah. So you can see that it is very close to this either. This, no, this is not it. So this is last one, D. Okay, so D is the correct graph. I can select that. And then let's check this and see if everything is correct. And then we need to compare a uh, forecast of November using a two period moving average and a three period moving average. Okay, so first let's do k equal two. Okay, so change k here to two. And you see that for November, I have a uh, forecast of 190. Let's check this. And then for three period moving average, I will change the K to three and I get 200.33. And then uh, I need to compare MSEs as well. So MSE here is 769.33. And if I change this to two, my MSE would be 486.29. So that's the comparison between these two. And again, as you can see here, my uh, two period moving average is a much better model because it has lower uh, error uh, as shown by the mean squared errors. Now let's go to question number seven, okay. So question number seven, a restaurant wants to forecast its weekly sales. Historical data in dollars for 15 weeks are shown below. Use Excel and the moving average template to answer the following questions. Again, we need a graph and also forecast for week 16 using a two period, three period, pretty similar to the previous question. Okay, just for the sake of being through, let's go ahead and solve this. So this is my data and First, I need to plot this, which is 
just getting a scatter plot. Okay, so this is my observations. I can compare it with these graphs and see which one is the correct one. As you can see, it's uh, pretty similar to A, option A. So I can say that A is the correct answer. Go ahead and check that. And then let's go ahead and see for week 16, if you use a two period moving average and a three period moving average, what happens, okay? So here I'm gonna go ahead and use these observations and enter them here. And then for two month moving average, this is gonna be my forecast. 15.08, and this is gonna be my MSE. And then I change this to three, and I get a forecast of 15.65, and a MSE of 36,744, okay. So let's check this as well. So everything is correct. And as you can see here, my three month, three period moving average is a better month. Okay. So now let's go to question number eight. So question number eight is, uh, says that the president of a small manufacturing firm is concerned about the continual growth in manufacturing costs in the past several years. The data series of the cost per unit for the firm's leading product over the past eight years is as follows. Choose the correct graph for the time series. And uh, then after that, you need to basically uh, develop a, a regression equation and find the uh, average cost increase per year. So it's basically a uh, regression question. So let's go ahead and use this data. Open a new sheet and uh, let's tidy up this data here. So these are my X and Y values. So I can go ahead and use the Excel uh, built in tool for calculating, uh, performing the regression equation, regression analysis. So these are my Y values. And these are my X values. And I have labels in the first row and I want the answers to be plotted in here. And I here go ahead and click on the line fit plots, okay? So line fit plots basically gives me a scatter plot of X and Y especially if you have only one independent variable, it's gonna be quite helpful. So click OK here, and this is gonna be my line plot. So I can do a little uh, tweak here to make this uh, similar to what I need. So I need to change this to, for example, a scatter plot like this. So this is gonna be my fit line. and this is going to be the uh, basically observed values. So I can go ahead and compare this with these different graphs that I have here and see which one is closer to this. Okay. So again, I can see that it's pretty close to option A, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, option A seems to be the correct answer. Let's check this. If this is correct. And then let's go ahead and continue our work. Then it asks for the regression equation. So regression equation, I have them here. This is my intercept and this is my uh, slope. So my intercept is 18.02, I can enter it here. And my slope is 1.56, I can enter it here. And then finally it says uh, the average cost increase per year. What is the average cost increase per year? Again, please pause the video and think about this question. What is the average increase per year?
the slope is basically the annual increase. That's your, your valuable variable cost, basically. Your intercept is you can think about it as your fixed cost and your variable cost, year over year increase. Okay, so this is basically the cost increase per year. Okay. If you're not sure, just go ahead and plug in two different values for X, the value of three and value of four, and compare them. You see that the difference is going to be this because basically the intercept is going to get canceled. And the difference between x is going to be one, and one multiplied by slope is going to be the slope. So that is that for all these eight questions. And then when we go into our case study, you will see how we are uh, using all these uh, assignments that we have done. So it's not just something uh, that we are doing to do some like statistical analysis or so. Uh, we are using these different techniques that we, are we have learned in uh, forecasting in our case study, which we will review in a uh, second. Now, we are done with the assignments. There are two Excel activities here. Let's go ahead and review them quickly. Uh, uh, first activity is a moving average. Okay. And there's a video that walks you through this step by step. You are basically building the template that uh, you are using, a very uh, a simplified version of the template that you are using. We are building that. Okay. So uh, we are going to go ahead and start working on this. Okay. So uh, for our moving average here, we have the periods and moving average is. Uh, three, okay, and we want to go ahead and calculate the basically the forecast. So as you know, the moving average is basically the average of the uh, case um, previous observations. So my K is three is going to be the three previous observations. Okay, so forecast for month four is going to be the average of month one, two, and three. And then I can copy this down. So this is going to be all the way. So these are all the averages, and also for month, oops, for month uh, thirteen, it's going to be the same thing. Okay, it's going to be the average of the three previous uh, observations. Okay, so that's basically the forecast, and uh, error is going to be the actual value minus the forecast, and I can copy this down as well. And then error squared is going to be this value. Carrot two, and these are the basically squared uh, errors. And then finally, I can go ahead and calculate my MSE, which is the average of all these error squared values. Okay, you see that my MSE is 19.5. So let's go ahead and check this and see if everything is correct. Uh, so this MSC is correct, and uh, now it asks me to for a uh, basically a graph for this a period moving average, okay? So for graph, I can go ahead and just uh, get the uh, values of demand and forecast, okay? For all these 13 periods, okay? I can also choose the time period as well, and then go ahead and insert a uh, scatter plot, which is connected with lines. And this is going to be basically my graph here, okay? So, and then we can go, go ahead and compare it with different graphs that I have here and see which one is the correct answer. And uh, it asks for uh, which forecast is, uh, is, the base, uh, is the best based on MSE. So you need to do four period and three period and compare them and find out which one is the best, okay? So this was for three periods, and then you need to continue this for four periods. So I have the, I have to repeat this whole thing, average of these four uh, previous periods, along with the last one. Again, error is 80 minus FT, copy all the way down. And also this carrot two, 
will give me my squared errors. And average of all these would be my MSC. Okay. And then I can write a little F function to compare these two. And, uh, and that's not a big deal. You can just go ahead and do that. And again, if I go ahead and calculate, uh, select everything here and build a little uh, scatter diagram connected with dots, this is going to be my uh, chart. And again, I can compare this chart with the correct answer. And again, between these two MSE, you see that uh, three period is a better uh, option. And then you can go ahead and say that, okay, this is correct. And this is the correct answer. Fantastic. Now let's go ahead and continue our work to our last uh, uh, work, Excel activity exponential smoothing. Okay, here we have uh, uh, same basically material. Then the difference is that we have single exponential smoothing. Okay, so for single exponential smoothing, we are using the formula that we have to calculate the forecast. Okay, so if you remember, the formula is basically alpha times AT plus one minus alpha FT. Okay, so I'll write, write it somewhere for you here. And this is a protected sheet, so I cannot write anything okay, can right here. This is good. So this is the formula. So it's, I know that FT plus one for the next period okay, is equal to uh, AFFT, the forecast for this period, okay, plus alpha, uh, or let's use the other one. Okay, this, this, this is much easier. Okay, you can say that alpha times the actual value of this period. So alpha times the actual value of this period plus one minus alpha the forecast value for this period, okay? This is an easier way to basically conceptualize this formula, okay? So again, as you can see here, I'm uh, assigning a weight of alpha to the actual value of this period for the next period, and uh, one minus alpha to all the previous ones. Okay, so for example, if I have a 0.2 alpha, I'm giving 20% uh, weight to the, this most recent observation and 80% weight to all the other observations. All the other observations are, ca are uh, basically uh, uh, um, conceptualized into in FT. Okay, FT is also basically calculated based on this. So it uh, incorporates all the values in the past. So now let's go ahead and use this formula to calculate the uh, forecast. So this is equal to alpha and I'm going to copy it down so I need to lock it here so this is my alpha and then uh, absolute cell reference times uh, my observation that I have here okay so actually I made a mistake so for the very first one it's always the case for the very first one for the first time period it's always going to be the same as the observation okay so for uh basically single exponential smoothing it's always going to be the same so 93 and 93 and for the second one is also going to be what going to be the same so you can go ahead and either enter it manually or use the formula either way it's going to be the same it's kind of for the first and second period it's going to be exactly the same as the first uh, observations. So we can go ahead and use the formula. So this is the alpha. I'm going to lock it times uh, a sub t, which is the value that I have here. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, so a sub t. So this is f2, f2 plus 1. If this is f2, this is going to be a, a1. Okay. So alpha times a1 plus one minus alpha, again, um, use absolute cell reference, F1, 
Okay, so F1 is here. Okay, again, you can see that the, the, since these two are equal to each other, 93 and 93, C3 and D, D, C6 and D6 are both 93. And this is alpha and one minus alpha. This addition of these two is just one. So it's basically going to be 93 again. But going forward, it's going to be different. I can use the same formula. Going forward, you see that it will be different. And finally, I will get the uh, value of forecast for the next period and errors let's go ahead and calculate the errors as well so for the first one i have an error of um zero let's see if i made a mistake Everything is correct. So that's it. And then I have the there's correct values. And finally, my mean squared error is going to be equal to the average of all those uh, squared errors. Okay, so which is 18 point. 19 i can go ahead and use these and it can, i also can use these three columns to build a little graph so it's going to be my graph is again it's going to be all the same technique and i can compare it with the correct answer now let's go ahead and start working on our case study okay while I'm loading the case study, please pause the video and think about the synopsis of the case. What was going on? What was the story here? This case describes a telephone call center or a contact center uh, where 98% of the call volume is from internal customers like the bank sales force, trust administrators, uh, branch managers, uh, wealth advisors, so on and so forth. Uh, here, accurate and quick answers are expected from the customer service representative. Uh, we should uh, know that uh, staff call center scheduling is very critical to maxi maximizing service and minimizing costs. And of course, the first step uh, is an accurate short-term forecast of call volume by day. So here we have a small sample of call volume data which is presented in the case and uh, you are asked to determine the best method or methods of uh, forecasting this data and uh, this data can be evaluated using uh, simple graphs like time series regression analysis and so on uh, although the focus here is on forecasting uh, there are also several other uh, supply chain operations issues that can be addressed First question is that, what are the service management characteristics of a CSR job? Uh, CSR is customer service uh, representative. Uh, so what is what are some of the characteristics of this job? Please pause the video and uh, answer the question uh, before proceeding to uh, the next part of this video. Uh, typical CSR job characteristics include uh, service management skills like uh, uh, simultaneous technical or operational and marketing and human interaction skills. Uh, their job is heavily monitored. They have a, usually it's electronically done and it's electronically monitored. Compared to what they do, the pay is not very high because it's not uh, doesn't have uh, very high analytical skills and require very high analytical skills or any uh, other type of skills. Uh, it's very stressful. Uh, they need to show empathy to the customer. They need to be very patient, they need to sit all day. And uh, you, most probably supervisors are listening on their calls. There's no privacy. And uh, it's not very healthy and more, very stressful job, okay? You compared to all of most other jobs, it's very stressful and uh, unhealthy. So uh, question number two says, define the mission statement and strategy of the help desk contact center. Uh, why help desk is important and who are the customers? So customers are uh, usually uh, from inside the bank or inside the institution in this example, as you can see. And uh, a, a typical mission could be to provide accurate and timely resolution of customer problems 
and, and inquiries for the bank, for example. Okay. And uh, this question, this question number three is rather important. Uh, how would you handle the customer affected by inaccurate stock prices in the bank's trust account system? Would you take a passive approach or a proactive approach? Justify your answer. Okay, it's a good idea to pause the video here and uh, think about uh, this question. Uh, how would you address uh, this situation? How would you handle that the customer that has been affected by the inaccurate stock price in the bank's uh, trust account system? Would you take a passive approach or a proactive approach? Uh, think about this for a few uh, minutes and then proceed with the next part of this video. So first we need to look into the problem and see if this is actually an error. And if this is the error, first we need to uh, apologize and uh, send a uh, corrected uh, account statement. Um, need to be proactive and search for all other accounts looking for so to see if this is a systematic error. Maybe there is a uh, problem with our software or uh, operations or uh, manpower and so on. And then finally, we need to uh, call for a meeting with the appropriate system and support and uh, retail and backroom and so on and so forth to uh, do a root cause analysis, basically, and find out what was the exact, uh, basically, main uh, root cause of this problem that created this error. Talk about root cause analysis a little bit. Root cause analysis is a systematic approach that is used to identify the underlying or fundamental causes of a problem or a uh, undesirable event. Uh, the goal here is to go beyond addressing uh, only the symptoms of an issue and uh, going to discover and address the root causes, which is uh, when, you when you resolve those root causes, this can help prevent the problem from uh, happening again. Uh, root cause analysis uh, could be applied in many different fields, including engineering, healthcare, quality control, and the business management. It is also sometimes called five whys, uh, which is a um, technique that basically involves asking five whys, uh, or basically multiple times asking why to identify the root cause of the problem. An interesting example of five whys or a root cause analysis is the uh, um, example of Jefferson Memorial in Washington DC that was uh, eroding very quickly, uh, meaning it was becoming uh, very expensive to maintain. Uh, the 5 Y techniques has been used and, uh, to identify the cause of this problem. So on this topic, let's go ahead and watch a short video together that explains uh, what is root cause analysis and what is 5 Ys. Years ago, the stone exterior was deteriorating at the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C., a popular monument in the United States. Repairing the stone or painting over the worn areas was too expensive, so park rangers turned to root cause analysis and started asking why. Why was the stone deteriorating? High-powered sprayers were being used to wash the memorial every two weeks. Why were high-powered washings needed every two weeks? Because of bird droppings. Asking why stopped because it seemed the cause was found. Workers put nets around the building, but they were unsightly, and the birds found ways around them. So it was back to the drawing board, or the five whys. Why are there so many birds? They come to feed on spiders. Why are there so many spiders? They feed on insects at night. Why are there so many insects? They're attracted by lights that shine on the memorial at night. With a new cause found, questions stopped, and a plan was created to reduce the amount of time the memorial spent in the spotlight at night, and it worked. The insects were reduced by 90%, and with the root cause removed, the excessive cleaning was no longer needed. An unexpected benefit was a cost savings realized by using less electricity. This highlights how root cause analysis can involve trial and error, and how the five whys isn't always limited to exactly five questions. Read more about root cause analysis and the Jefferson Memorial story at the link below. Okay, and then finally, uh, this part of our case question is analytical. While well, using the data on call volume in the table, how would you forecast short-term short -term demand? Okay, so this is going to be basically a combination of all the methods that we used here in this technique, okay, in this um, class. So yeah, let's see if we have enough time. So I'm going to go ahead and this. So first, let's go ahead and do a uh, 
moving average. Okay. Well, actually, let me go ahead and use the pre built. And that's, that's much easier. So this is the data that I have, okay? So this is the this data from 204 to 500 from day one to 16. I enter it in this uh, moving average template. And then you see that this template uh, is able to do two, three, and four. So I will do all these three and I uh, basically record the uh, MSE for each of these uh, case. For K equal two, I have a 5,057, uh, basically MSE, which is the lowest among these, uh, these three different uh, case, okay? And then after that, I will do a uh, single exponential smoothing. Okay? Again, like what we saw, uh, I will do that and I will continue it for all different values of alpha. Okay, so here is my data again from 204 to 500. I will plug in 0.1 and get the MSE and continue this all the way for, for example, 0 0.9, 0 0.1. Uh, and, and I see that, for example, here, my uh, lowest MSE is at 0.7. Again, comparing these two, I still see that my moving average has a lower MSE. And then finally, the last method that I can use is the uh, basically regression analysis. So I'm going to go ahead and use the regression analysis as well. So in regression analysis, uh, this is again my data and the same technique that we use. These are the coefficients. So this is going to be my intercept and this is my time period. So if I want to have a regression equation, it's going to be y equal to 234 plus 17 times 37 times x. So this is my regression equation. And important thing here is that this is the MSE. Okay, so MSE or MS residual for this model is 3,326, which is uh, significantly lower than all uh, to uh, all other models. The MSE, the lowest MSE that I could find in uh, moving average with a K of two was 5,000 something. And for a uh, single exponential smoothing with an alpha of 0.7 was again 500, uh, 5,200 something. And here I have a 30, uh, 3,300 uh, MSE, which is the lowest MSE. I can also go ahead and do the plot. So this is going to be the technique that I will use. I will use the regression equation 2B2, and this is going to be the regression. Uh, I will use regression analysis, and this is going to be the equation that I will use. You see that my R squared is not bad. It sees that it's almost 70% of the variability is being explained, which is okay. Um, it shows that there are some other variables there that I need to look into. But again, as it is, it's not really bad. And I can use this to predict uh, the uh, volume for the next uh, time periods. And I cannot go that far because I'm not I'm not going to be very sure that uh, the, uh, the shape of this line will stay the same. And uh, again, uh, accordingly, I can manage to hire more people or put more people on overtime and so on and so forth. So this is just was an example of a micro case that uses uh, forecasting in uh, action and how you can compare the, these two different methods. When we are doing all this in uh, reality, the whole point is to have a dashboard that uh, compares all these different models. Okay, So you can have a uh, basically your data input and you see all the different results and be able to compare them together and find out which model is the best model and so on and so forth. That's the key point here and having different uh, measures of error and being, care being careful about the R squared if, if you're using a, a regression analysis, for example. And now let's go ahead and review the conceptual parts of this chapter, uh, which are uh, two sections. One is check your knowledge and the other one is the quiz for the concepts that we have covered in this chapter. 
Okay, first re let's review the check your knowledge part. Uh, this is the conceptual part of uh, your homework. Let's go ahead and review these questions one by one together. Okay, our first question says the process of projecting the values of one or more variable into the future is called accounting, abstracting, forecasting, or manifesting. This is forecasting. This is the textbook definition or technical definition of forecasting. We take values from the past and basically project them into the future. Let's go review question number two. Which of the following is a pre-production service? A value chain that requires forecast to gain customers in the value chain. Uh, so here we have uh, determining salesperson targets and incentives, providing field and call center service training, assessing supplier performance and trends, and analyzing economic trends. The answer here is determining salesperson targets and uh, incentives. If you go back to the uh, part in your chapter which talks about the forecasting across value chain and uh, uh, we're in the foc uh, focal firm which we which production or basically service providing happens what type of uh, need uh, forecasting needs we have and then in the pre-production and post-production meaning the upstream and downstream of your supply chain what type of uh, forecasts are needed this is where you get the answer the answer is determining salesperson targets and incentives uh, let's go to question number three. Question number three says, which of the following is a post-production service in a value chain that requires forecast to keep customers in the value chain? Providing a field and call center service training, determining salesperson targets and incentives, determining financing needs, or assessing goods and services demand. In this case, the answer is providing field and call center service training. Remember the post-production or downstream, which we are dealing with customer, one of the most important parts is keeping the customer. And uh, keeping the customer uh, requires uh, basically providing a good customer service. One of the components of a good customer service system is having a call center. If you remember, uh, our case study was also focused on a call, uh, on a call center and how we can uh, use forecasting to better staff our call center. Question number four, the length of time on which forecast is based is known as a time bucket, the planning horizon, time series, or a seasonal pattern. The answer here is the planning horizon. Remember, we talked about the planning horizon and the time bucket planning horizon is basically the uh, the uh, extent of time in the future that you want to do your forecast in. For example, is it, is it over a year? Is it over five years? Is it over just two months? And so on and so forth. And then the unit of time that you use in this analysis is time bucket, whether it is days, month, and so on and so forth. Question number five, the unit of measure for the time period used in a forecast is known as time series, throughput time, the time bucket, or turnaround time. Just talked about it. This is the uh, basically time bucket. The time bucket is the correct answer here. Question number six Which of the following is a set of observations measured at successive points in time over uh, or over successive periods of time? A trend, a time bucket, throughput time, or a time series? Remember, this is the definition of time series. When we measure something, measure right, basically whatever variable that we are interested in over successive periods of time, we call this a time series. The time series is basically a set of X and Y in which X is always time. Uh, now let's move to question number seven. Which of the following is or are characterized by repeatable periods of ups and downs over short periods of time? Random variation, seasonal patterns, irregular variation, or a cyclical pattern? In this uh, case, uh, as you know, the answer is seasonal pattern. Examples were like the uh, consumption of ice cream over one year or the natural gas uh, consumption over one year and so on and so forth. Remember the most important piece here is that uh, seasonal patterns are uh, basically uh, measured over one year and uh, they always have uh, something to do with the seasons of a year mo in most cases. And uh, this, this was the main difference between them and cyclical patterns which happen 
over uh, longer periods of time. Uh, question number eight, in the context of forecast errors, which of the following statements about mean squared error or MSE is true? It is generally a less popular measure than mean absolute percentage error or MAPE. It is simply the average of some of the absolute deviations from all the forecast errors. It is independent of uh, the measurable scale of the time series data. Or finally, it is influenced much more by large forecast errors than by small errors. So the answer here is A, it is influenced much more by a large forecast error than by a small error. And the reason is that uh, the, the, the terms uh, error terms are being squared. Remember, we had the multiple ways to um, basically get rid of the negative values of error so they don't cancel each other. One of the methods was to uh, square them, uh, raise them to the power of two. One of the other methods was to get the absolute uh, value of them. Since we are uh, squaring all these uh, error terms, if we have a big error, uh, by uh, in turn, uh, the squared value of that error is going to be very high. So the mean squared error is also going to be uh, inflated to a great extent. Uh, question number nine, a statistical forecasting methods can generally be categorized as biased methods and unbiased methods, linear methods and exponential methods, the quantitative methods and judgmental methods, and time series methods and regression methods. The answer here is time series methods and uh, regression methods. Remember, we are talking about statistical forecasting. We are not talking about all the types of forecasting. If we're just talking about forecasting, it would be basically uh, quantitative and judgmental. But quantitative methods are basically the same as statistical methods. The statistical forecasting, for statistical methods, we have these two types, time series methods and regression methods. Remember, time series is basically a uh, uh, projection or extrapolation of the previous values into the future. But in regression, uh, we can also uh, only have uh, time as the independent variable, or we can include more than time. And the method here uh, is a little different. We use the least squared uh, technique. Uh, question number 10, in the context of statistical forecasting models, which of the following statements about a moving average or MA is true? MA methods always remember all the data old, uh, all the data older than K periods in the past. Uh, MA forecasts are based on averages using and weighing the most recent actual demand more than older demand data. A disadvantage of MA forecast is that the time series exhibits a positive trend. Uh, that if the time series uh, exhibits a positive trend, the forecast will lag the actual values. And finally, DMA methods work best for short planning horizons where there is no major trend, seasonal or business cycle problems. So for this question, the answer is MA methods work best uh, for short planning horizons when there is no major trend, seasonal or business cycle patterns. This is the correct answer. Uh, question number uh, 11, uh, in the single exponential smoothing SES technique, the value of the smoothing constant alpha falls within the range of, um, as you know, the range here is between 0 and 1. Uh, alpha is a value between 0 and 1. And uh, based on that, we uh, put some emphasis, emphasis on the recent observations and uh, Another, uh, basically, one minus alpha is going to be the emphasis on the, uh, all other observations. So question number 12 here, we have the simple linear regression finds the best values of the intercept and slope of the straight line that best fits a time series using the Leibniz integral rule, a method of least squares, Fourier transform, transform rule, or method of moving averages. The correct answer here is method of least uh, squares. Again, uh, remember from the lecture, what we do is we try to uh, find a line uh, uh, for which the distance between these uh, observations that we have and uh, this line, the squared of these uh, distances is the minimum, basically the line that best fits these uh, lines. Uh, question number 13, in the context of regression analysis, the R-squared uh, value 
is a measure of how much variation in the dependent variable is explained by the independent variable, the sum of the most recent observations in a time series, the difference between the observed values, observed value of a time series and a forecast, an average of the percentage error for each forecast value in a time series divided by the mean absolute uh, deviation. So as you can, uh, as you know, the answer here is the measure of how much variation in the dependent variable is explained by the independent variable. This is the correct answer. R squared, uh, usually we are looking for high R squared values and R squared of 75%, for example, means that this uh, regression equation that we have uh, is explaining 75% of the variation and 25% of the variation is still unknown. So the higher, obviously the higher the R squared, the better. Uh, in uh, it, uh, the value of R squared, R squared, the value of a good R squared is usually dependent on the field in which we are doing the analysis. So in hard science, usually we are looking for R squareds of uh, very high, high values, like 90% or above. In business and uh, economics, sometimes we, based on the uh, availability of data, uh, we are going to be very happy if even if we have a 50% R-squared. Again, as I said, it depends uh, highly on the uh, application and the field, but in general, anything above 75% or 50% is acceptable. So question number 14, which of the following is a judgmental forecasting approach that involves asking those who are close to the end consumer, such as salespeople, about the customer's purchasing plans? A moving average forecast, a single exponential smoothing for SES, or a statistical forecasting, or uh, finally, grassroots forecasting. So the answer here is grassroots forecasting. Remember, uh, this was one of the techniques this and delphi method were the two techniques that we introduced in the area of judgmental forecasting we use judgmental forecasting or qualitative forecasting whenever we don't have data or uh we we are uh not we cannot rely on our data we are not really happy with the data that have, we have been collected for example it has been collected from a sample that is not representative of the population our sample size is too small or the time horizons that we had uh, the time periods that we had in our time series is too small or we uh, basically predict that something uh, big something like a black swan event could happen in the future in those cases we do judgmental forecasting one of the techniques for judgmental forecasting is grassroots forecasting in which we talk with the people who are closest uh, to the end consumers, such as salespeople, for example. Uh, and uh, questions are going to be, for example, about customers purchasing plans. Question 15, which of the following is a judgmental forecasting approach that involves gathering judgmental and opinions of key personnel based on their experience and knowledge of a, a situation? Regression analysis, the Delphi method, single exponential smoothing, or the time bucket method? So the answer here is the Delphi method. The Delphi method is a structured communication and forecasting technique that is used to gather and synthesize input from a panel of experts or uh, participants to make informed decisions or predictions about a specific topic or issue. Uh, it was developed in the early 50s by the RAND Corporation as a way to systematically uh, aggregate the opinions and expertise of a group of experts in a particular field. Uh, the Delphi method is often used in uh, various fields, including business, healthcare, technology, and uh, policy analysis. Uh, so uh, these are the different steps of how the Delphi method works. First is the selection of experts, a panel of experts or participants which, uh, with relevant knowledge and uh, expertise in the uh, subject matter are going to be selected. These experts are often chosen for their diversity in uh, perspective and background. And then we need to develop a questionnaire. Uh, the facilitator or organizer of the Delphi process needs to develop a series of open-ended questions or statements uh, which are related to the topic of interest. These questions are uh, usually designed to uh, enable us to obtain opinions, predictions, and also recommendations from the participants. 
And then uh, the important piece here is the iterative rounds. So the third step is the iterative rounds. Uh, the Delphi process is typically conducted in multiple rounds uh, with feedback provided to participants between each round. So basically in each round, uh, participants individually respond to the questionnaire and their responses are collected and summarized by the facilitator. And then uh, those uh, summarized results are gonna be shared with the participants in the next round. The most important piece here that this uh, basically uh, the summaries are going to be anonymously shared with the participants in the next rounds. And the main reason here is to avoid the conformity bias. Conformity bias is the tendency of people to, uh, to behave like those around them rather than using their own uh, personal uh, judgment. So that's why they're, 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 this anonymity is uh, basically uh, designed into this system. And then after uh, uh, rounds of uh, feeding the summary of uh, opinions. We will have discussions and feedback. And finally, uh, after we receive, uh, we get to a consensus. Uh, um, um, basically, the goal here is to reach a consensus and or convergence of uh, opinions. And then based on, based on that, the final report will be created. And then this report could be used to uh, use for decision making. So uh, again, as I mentioned, the most important piece in the Delphi method is that uh, anonymity of uh, feedback. And uh, again, as I said, it is because uh, of uh, making sure that conformity bias is not happening. So on the topic of conformity bias, let's go ahead and watch a short video on a very uh, famous uh, experiment called Solomon Ash that basically measures this uh, confirmation or conformity bias. And then uh, once we come back, we will continue with the rest of this uh, questions. We're on the deck of the USS Intrepid conducting an experiment, and the rules of the game couldn't be simpler. You've got to decide which one of these three straight lines is the same length as this first card. Take a look for yourself. Think you've got it? Before we reveal the answer, we'll show you where these people stand. I think it's A. 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 It's A. Yeah, I'm gonna go with A. It looks like everyone is going with A. Definitely A. Do they know something you don't? What do you think? Take one last look. Are you going with these people who all picked A? Or did you choose to go with B or C? Time's up. Got your pick? Uh, it's A. You're gonna go with the group? Yeah. All right, great. Is that what you picked? Or did you go with another answer? It turns out the answer to this round is C. And while you likely chose C first and stuck with your answer, we also know that some viewers might have felt the peer pressure and switched to A. It's A. I wanna ask you something. Did your gut at first tell you that the answer was actually C? Yeah, but everyone was choosing A, so I just felt like I had to pick A too. You felt the pull of the crowd. Yeah. In case you haven't figured it out yet, we'll let you in on a little secret. The first nine people in this line were working for us, and each time we ran the experiment, they were instructed to pick the same wrong answer. A. 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 It's A. Seeing all these people choose A left the last person in line who wasn't in on it with a tough decision to go with their gut or with a group. You're gonna go with the group? Yeah. Although not all of the test subjects at the yeah. end of the line fell for it. I think it's C. In spite of what everybody else thinks, you don't trust the wisdom of the crowd? Uh, I'm trusting my gut. Okay. To be perfectly honest, I think C looks closest. And you think that they're all wrong? Yeah. Okay. Hi, guys. And don't beat yourself up if you were tempted to go along with the crowd. Make your choice. I'm gonna have to go with A. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. What happened? I have a confession. Okay. I, I actually thought it was C. So. Did you start to question your own judgment? I did. I don't want to be the dumb kid. I don't want to stand out. You know, I was like, A. Have you ever ignored the truth to fit in with a group? Just think, what if those weren't lines? but evidence in a murder case. Would you be able to see past the group consensus and just go with your gut? Studies show that when someone holds a different opinion than the rest of the group, the anterior cingulate cortex, also known as the oops area of the brain, produces an error signal. 
We try to fix that by modifying our opinion to be in line with the group, even if it's a viewpoint we're uncomfortable with or know is wrong. And that's because there are some major evolutionary advantages for those who follow along with the group, namely survival. If you want to stay safe, stay with the herd. Question number 16 says, which of the following can be used by forecasters to determine when it might be advantageous to change or update the forecast model? A bias value, a tracking signal, the time bucket, or regression analysis. So the answer here is a tracking signal. Remember, tracking signal was a measure of bias. And uh, whenever it is more than uh, positive four or less than negative four, means that our uh, forecast model is showing bias. And the main difference between bias and error is that the bias is a systematic error that always shows the, always forecast the values uh, much higher or much lower than the actual values. And finally, question number 17, which of the following is not one of the 10 principles to guide best practices in forecasting that were published by a group of international experts? Seek feedback about forecast, if uh, combining forecasts begin with equal weights, use structured procedures to integrate judgmental and quantitative methods, and use qualitative rather than quantitative methods. So uh, the answer here is uh, D, use qualitative rather than quantitative methods. This is exactly the opposite of the, what is uh, basically uh, suggested or prescribed in that uh, 10 uh, principles. Basically, the recommendation is that we should always start with quantitative methods, and then after that, we should combine it with qualitative methods or qualitative forecasting, which is uh, basically relies on the judgment, expertise, and uh, subjective opinions of individuals or groups to make predictions about future events. So this concludes our work here on uh, the uh, check your knowledge. Let's go ahead and review the next piece, which is your quiz. Okay, question number one here, field and call center service training is located at the keeping the customer, gaining the customer value creation or pre-production services. This is keeping the customer or post-production. Again, remember this goes all back to the uh, pre-production and post-production view towards a uh, value chain or supply chain and how uh, different needs, uh, different forecasting needs uh, are present at each of these uh, steps of the way in a value chain. So question number two says that a uh, blank provides data for understanding how the variable that we wish to forecast has changed historically. Planning uh, horizon, time bucket, time series, or trend. This is a time series, basically the data that we collect from the uh, past, historic data that we collect about uh, the variable that we are interested in to find out how it behaved uh, in the past. So question number three, blank patterns are characterized by repeating periods of ups and downs over a short period of time where blank patterns are regular patterns in a data series that take place over a long period of time. So first one is the seasonal pattern. Seasonal patterns are characterized by repeated periods of time over short periods of time. Usually this short period of time is one year and of, uh, over one year we, we will have the seasons. Whereas cyclical patterns are regular patterns in a data series that take place over a long period of time, usually longer than one year. And examples of seasonal pattern, we can uh, talk about the, the natural gas consumption, for example. And for cyclical patterns, we can talk about uh, the booms and busts of, in, uh, of a, uh, a stock market. So now question number four, uh, blank variations is caused by short-term on. Uh, anticipated and non-recurring uh, factors. Here uh, we are talking about a random variation. Random variation is basically a, a variation that cannot be uh, explained, and um, basically we cannot put a put, put our finger on the cause of those variations. And it's mainly because of the random variations that we cannot have one hundred percent accurate uh, forecasts. Question number five, blank is calculated by squaring the individual forecast errors and then averaging the results over all T periods of the time series. 
uh, mean squared error, mean forecast error, mean absolute deviation, or mean absolute percentage error. The answer here is mean squared error. Mean squared error basically is the uh, most uh, common uh, measure of error for uh, finding out uh, how good your model is for forecasting. And question number six, which of the following is a key difference between mean squared error and mean absolute uh, deviation? Uh, first, the value of the mean squared error depends on the measurement of the time series data. Second, mean squared error is influenced much more by large forecast errors than by small errors. Uh, a market share error will always have a small mean squared error, while the market share error will always have a large mean absolute deviation. Uh, mean squared error is influenced much more by small forecast errors than by large errors. So the answer here is mean squared error is influenced much more by large forecast errors than by small uh, errors. Uh, again, uh, as I explained in the previous section in our Check Your Knowledge, uh, the reason is that we, in order to get rid of negative values, we raise everything to the power of two and we square every value. Question number seven, uh, in a moving average forecast, as the value of K um, increases or stabilizes or stays the same or decreases, the forecast reacts slowly to recent changes in the time series. As the value of K, again, either increases, decreases, or stabilizes, the forecast reacts more quickly. When we basically want to see uh, for what type of values of K the forecast reacts slowly and for uh, what uh, values of K the forecast reacts quickly. So when uh, K increases, okay, the forecast reacts slowly. Basically, we are doing the averaging over a longer period of time, and this basically smooths the, uh, the forecast much more. Uh, compared to the uh, smaller values of K. And when we have uh, smaller values of K, or basically when K decreases, the forecast reacts more quickly because we are uh, placing more emphasis on the more recent uh, observations. And for example, a, uh, a, for example if, if we have a K of one, you remember that it was a naive forecast. It was exactly a, a copy of what we have uh, one period in the future. And again, uh, generally for small values of K, we have a more reactive and uh, basically more responsive time type of uh, uh, forecasting. Question number eight, a small value of the smoothing constant is preferred when the time series contains relatively little random variability, stable data, substantial random variability, or a small mean square error the answer here is substantial random uh, variability so, so when we, when you have substantial random variability it's always a good idea to use a uh, very small value of uh, smoothing constant so when we have a substantial random variability it's always a good idea to use a small value of alpha a small of a value of alpha is uh, preferred uh, because uh, it places more weight on the recent data points and less on the historical data. And this helps the forecast or the smooth value to react quickly to the random fluctuation. And that this makes the forecast more responsive to short-term changes and uh, better at tracking the noisy and unpredictable variations in the data. Question number nine, regression analysis is a method for building a statistical model that defines a relationship between a single independent, randomized, dependent, or minimized variable and one or more independent, randomized, dependent, or minimized variable, all of which are numerical. So uh, you know that regression analysis is always uh, for building a relationship between a dependent and an independent variable. So the dependent variable is always uh, one. So that's why the answer here is dependent. The keyword here is single. And then one or more, we can have more one or more independent variables. Namely, when we are doing forecasting, uh, if we use just time, we will have a simple linear regression. And if we use time and other variable, other independent variables will have uh, multiple uh, regression. Question number 10, the method of least squares 
minimizes the sum of squares deviations between the actual dependent sum of square independent time series values and the estimated values of again moving average dependent variables moving constant and independent vig. So the answer here is the actual values of the time series and the estimated value of the dependent variable. So as I mentioned, this least squares method wants to basically uh, find the best line, uh, best fitted line, and that's that based best fitted line, uh, which is the estimated values of the dependent variable should have the uh, smallest uh, deviation from the actual values of your time series. And we make sure to uh, to find the best line through the least squares uh, method. We find the distances between each of the uh, forecasts and actual values and square them and try to minimize them. Uh, question number 11, uh, blank forecasting relies upon uh, opinions and expertise of people in developing forecasts, whereas blank forecasting is asking those who are close to the end consumer about the customer's purchasing plans. So uh, this is judgmental forecasting. Judgmental forecasting relies upon opinions and expertise of people in developing a forecast. This is a general, uh, basically, um, category of non quantitative forecasting. When we are asking people who are closer to the end consumer, we are doing a grassroots uh, forecasting. So basically we can say that grassroots forecasting is a subcategory of judgmental forecasting, is a type of judgmental forecasting in which you uh, ask questions from uh, those experts who are closer to the end consumer. Question number 12, a blank provides a method for monitoring a forecast to determine when it might be advantageous to change or update the model. Remember, change or update the model was all about bias. We want to find out if uh, there is a bias. And for finding bias, we need to calculate the tracking signal. The tracking signal is basically a, a measure of bias. And if the tracking signal is greater than 4 or less than negative 4, uh, we need to basically, uh, we know that our model is biased and we need to update our model. The method most often used is to compute the cumulative forecast error divided the value of mean absolute deviation. So basically we get the uh, uh, total of our errors and divide that by the MAD, value of MAD or mean absolute deviation. And again, as I mentioned, if it is to extreme meaning it's over over positive four uh, below negative four we uh, conclude that our model is biased and finally question number 13 which of the following is not one of the 10 practical uh, principles of forecasting combine forecasts from approaches that are either the same or very similar use quantitative rather than qualitative methods compare past performance of various forecasting methods, and if combining forecasts begin with equal weights. Uh, so all of these three are correct. These are all among the 10 principles. This is not correct. Combine forecasts from approaches that are either the same or very similar. Uh, that is uh, not true. We should always combine forecasts from different approaches to be able to uh, take into account different factors that uh, influence our dependent variable or the variable that we are interested in. This concludes our work here in uh, chapter 9. Uh, please uh, send me an email if you have any questions or you need any clarification on any of these topics.